This webinar is hosted by the Legal Center for Youth Justice and Education, which is a collaboration of Southern Poverty Law Center, Juvenile Law Center, Education Law Center of Pennsylvania, and the American Bar Association Center on Children and the Law. And you're going to hear more about our blueprint for how to improve the education of juvenile justice involved youth through the presentations today. So first we're going to hear from Asaf. Um, Asaf Orr is an attorney at the Transgender Youth Project of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. He is going to give us some context for our conversation today. And then he's also going to move into explaining how our schools can push LGBTQ youth into the juvenile justice system. Lizzie, would you like me to start now? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Um, is my screen going to be shared? Perfect. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see my slides now. Um, so good morning uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, as Lizzie said, my name is Asaf, and I'm the Transgender Youth Project Staff Attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights. And what I'd like to start doing today before we get into sort of the, the content is to actually do a little bit of background, uh, particularly on trans kids, um, so that you as advocates and um, folks who work in this space get a sense of how, how to talk about trans kids, the issues that affect them, um, and, and their identities, because that, that is a very sort of critical uh, piece for uh, building understanding of the needs of trans kids. Uh, in particular. Um, so we just want to get quickly into key terms and definitions. Uh, gender identity is a deeply felt sense of being male, female, a blend of both or neither. I think the critical part uh, about gender identity is uh, understanding that, that current science recognizes that gender identity is innate or fixed at a young age, and that it's part of a number of characteristics that make up a person's biological sex. Um, and when there's a divergence among those characteristics, that gender identity gender is, is, is the most determinative factor. Um, gender expression refers to how someone expresses their gender, whether it's through behavior, clothing, hairstyles, name. Um, it's not necessarily indicative of a person's sex or sexual orientation, uh, but it's something to know that how it differs from gender identity. Uh, when we use the term, the word transgender, we're referring to someone whose sex is different than the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, and then non-transgender for people whose sex assigned at birth matches their, their sex or gender identity. Um, transition, this is somewhat of a, a misnomer. Uh, when we talk about transition, we're not talking about someone. Are you all hearing that feedback? All right, uh, I'm gonna maybe talk a little slower. Um, the transition is not someone starts male and becomes female or vice versa. Uh, they've always been female and what they're doing through transition is they're more closely aligning their outer selves with their gender identity. So this could be things like a social transition where we're talking about changing name, pronouns, clothing, uh, those kinds of things, or it could also include other you know, medications like puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, and also uh, eventually surgery uh, if the person decides. The key difference also, to, and lastly, sexual orientation, is make, most people misunderstand that gender identity and sexual orientation are not the same uh, or not linked. Um, they are very different concepts, and one way to sort of keep them separate um, as a mnemonic device is to say, you know, gender identity is who you want to go to sleep as, uh, and sexual orientation is who you want to go to bed with. Um, and so sexual orientation is a person's romantic or sexual attraction uh, to someone. And obviously this is going to change based on, or can change based on a person's gender identity, uh, but it's not, uh, they're not the same. And then I, I want to go over some quick sort of misconceptions or key facts that you may hear as you advocate for, for trans kids. Uh, the first is that children become aware 
of their gender identity between two and four years old, you'll very often hear that, oh, these kids are too young, there's no way they can know, um, and the reality is that they do know. Um, this differs slightly from sexual orientation, which is typically comes out around adolescence, although obviously there are gonna be kids for whom it comes, you know, they become aware of it earlier, and obviously people uh, who become aware of it later. Um, transgender kids have the same capacity to thrive as non-transgender kids if they are provided the love and support that all kids need. Um, and I think that is, you know, really helpful to counteract this idea that there's something inherently uh, dysfunctional about transgender kids, which is not true. Uh, in fact, what studies show is that the level of family acceptance or rejection is the key determinative factor of uh, a child's short and long-term mental health and well-being. Uh, the more rejecting behaviors, the more likely the child is going to engage in high-risk behaviors, have long-term mental health consequences, higher levels of suicidality. And on the flip side, the more accepting their home environment uh, creates a protective factor uh, and allows the child to deal with the discrimination they will experience on a daily basis. Um, there's this claim, you'll hear it often, that 80% of children stop asserting a transgender identity. Um, those studies are very flawed um, and really irrelevant. Uh, when you think about, you know, they don't talk about what to do with a kid who is going to no longer assert a trans identity into adolescence. Uh, and what the research is showing is that what's critical is that kids, regardless of where they end up in their gender journey, uh, that they feel supported and affirmed for who they are. Um, any attempt to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity is unethical and harmful, and a growing number of states are um, making it illegal for mental health providers to treat uh, LGBT kids in that way. Um, and then lastly, uh, having a disability does not undermine a person's ability to be transgender. Um, I'm gonna run quickly through the standards of care because I don't wanna um, sort of crunch what the other part of what I have to say. Um, and really just to sort of, the, the key things about the standards of care is that there is no uh, irreversible interventions until after puberty. After puberty. Um, prior to puberty, it's really about social transition and making sure that they can that a trans kid can live as who they are on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then when a get, kid gets to puberty, there are medications they can take to essentially pause puberty uh, until they can figure out with their providers what the next best step is. Um, and then after that, can come in cross-sex hormones. Um, and then similarly, uh, surgical treatment if necessary. But again, surgical treatment is not typically provided um, until mid or late adolescence. Um, okay, so now to the sort of main part of what we see in terms of LGBT kids being uh, either pushed out or sort of uh, shoved into the school to prison pipeline through school discipline. Um, you know, one of the things that, as I was preparing this presentation, the sort of thing that came to mind to me is like, this is kind of a, a choose your own adventure uh, kind of process where really the thumb is on the scales where pretty much every result um, uh, can, can get you into the school to prison pipeline. Um, so it's unfortunately not a very uh, fun choose your own adventure process, but it's it's a heavily weighted one. Um, and so when we look at schools, uh, when kids are mistreated in school, um, there are many ways that they react, right? And by mistreatment, I'm talking about bullying and harassment. Uh, talking about not allowing, not affirming trans kids for who they are, not allowing them to equal access to facilities. Um, and so each of these things can lead them into um, the school discipline or school push out. So for example, one of the things we often see uh, in response to bullying and harassment is that schools are not dealing with it effectively. And what kids ultimately feel like they, the only thing that they can do then is defend themselves. Uh, and typically they get caught up in zero tolerance policies, uh, which often results in them being suspended or even worse expelled. Um, and what studies have shown is that 
gender non-conforming kids. Um, this wasn't a study specifically for LGBT kids, uh, are disciplined more regularly and more harshly than their gender conforming peers. Um, and studies that have been done specifically around LGBT kids sort of confirms that. Um, and then when you then add you race or disability, those uh, those numbers increase significantly. So, you know, kids will, you know, fight back against their their the bullies that are perpetrating the bullying and harassment, um, and they'll be the only ones that get disciplined. Um, and obviously, sort of tied into that, as I hinted, is the implicit bias and inconsistent disciplinary practices. Um, and that again, you're gonna, you know, that once they sort of fall into, even if they don't get expelled uh, or suspended, they've then sort of been labeled as a trouble kid, and you know that'll sort of start even in the minds of the teachers and school administrators, school administrators. start to escalate uh, the way that they uh, respond to any incidents involving this young person. Similarly, if a kid is getting bullied and harassed in school on a regular basis or is being mistreated otherwise, they're not going to feel safe. They're not going to want to come to school. And so a significant number of LGBT kids report either skipping class or even skipping days of school entirely because they don't feel safe. And what that leads to, again, is it's going to affect uh, teachers' perceptions of this young person, administrators' perceptions of this young person, but it could also lead to poorer grades, uh, which when you're talking about high stakes testing, um, there's been a lot of articles where uh, showing that schools try to push out kids uh, who are not doing well academically, so they don't bring down, down the school's overall scores uh, when it comes to uh, high stakes testing. Um, and then if, there's, if the students are skipping school entirely, it's going to get them in trouble on the truancy front. Uh, and that is, can be, um, depending on the state, can be a direct contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, and what studies show is the more contacts you have with that system, the more likely you are to end up in that system. Um, and then what we also find when kids are not, do not feel safe in school, they have lower yeah. academic achievement in general. Um, and they also have lower, lower educational aspirations. So uh, LGBT kids are half as likely to uh, go on to higher education after high school. Um, those that do go on are more likely to get advanced degrees. But as a general matter, LGBT kids are not going to, not moving on to higher education um, as much as their um, non-LGBT peers. I put here family rejection. I know this is, you know, really focused on schools, but it would it would be a huge omission um, if we didn't talk about family rejection because that ultimately, even though outside the school, can have a significant effect on how a young person behaves in school. You know, if they're experiencing significant problems at home, um, that is going to come into the school. And as I mentioned earlier. Um, higher levels of family rejection are associated with difficulties in uh, mental health um, and functioning. And if they are coming to school with these serious mental health issues, or they're engaging in substance use or high-risk behaviors, uh, those are going to affect how, how they're perceived by teachers and administrators, and also you know, their ability to perform in school as is expected. Um, and then similarly, homelessness. Um, if, ki if kids are really being rejected and kicked out of their home, that is gonna affect their ability to, uh, to participate in, in school um, and are things that you know, schools really need to address um, and often don't uh, do as well as they should. So what are some of the are legal, some avenues, legal avenues uh, if you're working with an LGBT young person who is starting unfortunately into uh, what can seem like um, a self-fulfilling prophecy um, with regards to entering the school to prison pipeline. Thankfully, there are a number of uh, legal avenues to pursue. I think most commonly we think of Title IX. Uh, Title IX is a federal law that prohibits sex discrimination uh, 
from any institution receiving federal funds. And so this covers the vast majority of public schools and does cover some private schools who are increasingly accepting funds, for example, from the Department of Justice um, to increase school security or um, for free and reduced lunch and other programs. Um, if a school is subject to Title IX, um, you can look at a hostile school environment, environment for a student who's being bullied, being bullied and harassed, harassed, whether it's by students or teachers. Um, and then also, you can look at a denial of equal educational opportunity. Uh, this is particularly for transgender kids who are being denied access to facilities like restrooms or locker rooms, uh, or even access to sports. One thing I will note um, for Title IX, particularly with the hostile school environment, claims um, is that schools need to have actual notice. Um, so if you're working you're with a young person around bullying and harassment issue, it's really critical that the student report, and if they have a supportive family, that the family reports uh, to the principal or person who's in charge of discipline in the school so that the school has an opportunity to address the bullying and harassment. Bullying and harassment. Uh, with regards to the denial of educational equal educational opportunity, um, I just want to point out the growing number of cases where, where federal courts have um, issued preliminary injunctions uh, ensuring that transgender kids get access to the facilities and are treated consistent with their gender identity. Uh, these uh, cases are consistently winning. Um, you know, there's the Whitaker case from the Seventh Circuit. Uh, there's the Highland case from the Sixth Circuit. There is, is Benko from um, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that you are working with a young person experiencing these issues, uh, certainly don't hesitate to, to point out those cases um, and to reach out to, to NCLR um, for assistance uh, on those cases. Similarly, with equal protection, um, one of the, the key things that we can see in the equal protection, not only on the denial of um, access to facilities, uh, but when it comes to bullying and harassment, one of the key claims from equal protection is that the school is not investigating incidents of harassment and bullying um, of this of your client, the trans, the LGBT kid, as the as they are other students, um, or that they're disciplining uh, the LGBT kid more harshly or more frequently uh, than non-LGBT kids. Uh, that's the most sort of frequently how we see uh, the equal protection clause argument, um, but it can also be applied to other things that affect uh, LGBT kids. Uh, for example, with trans kids, uh, use of correct name and pronoun uh, in schools is another way uh, that we can look at you know, equal treatment or, or unequal treatment. I think it's also really important in the context of um, LGBT kids who are experiencing difficulty in school to not forget uh, disability discrimination laws as well as disability protections for kids. Um, you know, one of the things that we see with bullying and harassment, again, is the, the poor educational performance, um, or if they're dealing with family rejection, again, similarly poor educational performance. Um, and these are ways to provide support to, to LGBT kids in schools, um, you know, to um, provide counseling or, um, you know, specialized academic uh, instruction and related services that can help support this young person and address the difficulties they're experiencing in school. It also gives them a lot more protections that they that they have that they wouldn't have if they weren't part if they didn't have an IEP uh, or a, a Section 504 plan. Um, and one of the big things that that, that comes out of that is um, around behavior. Um, you're talking about kids who are more likely to be disciplined uh, and also disciplined more severely uh, when you have an IEP or 504 plan, there are lots of sort of requirements around discipline, particularly if you have an IEP um, around the behavior supports. And, you know, if a school wants to impose a severe type of discipline, for example, multi-day suspension, 
or, or an expulsion, uh, they'll have to go through this whole process of the manifestation determination to determine whether or not this young person's behavior is a manifestation of their disability, um, which really could lead to, instead of uh, leading to this young person yep. being expelled or suspended, could actually lead to more supports and services in school uh, to help them succeed uh, and achieve to their potential. And then I think it's important to, to remember that in addition to federal law, um, there are many state and local protections. Uh, there are anti-discrimination laws, depending on the state that you're in, that apply explicitly to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and then there are also those that apply to disability. And I realized one thing uh, I want to go back and, and touch on uh, with regards to Title IX uh, and the Equal Protection Clause, it does prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, and you know, although courts have been um, unanimous in applying that to gender identity as a component of sex. Um, it's certainly uh, much more of a patchwork when it applies to sexual orientation, although what we're seeing in the trend now is that uh, courts are recognizing that that sexual orientation uh, discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. In fact, you know, the, the Seventh Circuit held that um, in a case uh, this past summer, um, and just today, the Second Circuit um, held in, a, in an employment case that sexual orientation discrimination is sex discrimination. Um, so I think it's really important uh, that uh, if that if you are representing an LGB kid um, and they're being discriminated on the basis of sexual orientation, that you not hesitate to bring or raise Title IX um, and really sort of push that. Um, sexual orientation is a form of sex discrimination and certainly something that, that NCLR and other LGBT legal groups have a lot of resources on are happy to, to help uh, through uh, you all through that process and provide technical assistance. Um, and just as a last thank you all, this is my contact information and uh, Lizzie, take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Erica Smith who is an adolescent case manager uh, for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Adolescent Initiative Program at the Philadelphia Juvenile Justice Service, Services Center. She is going to discuss the experiences of LGBTQ youth who are placed in juvenile justice facilities. Take it away, Erica. Away, Erica. All right, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so as Lizzie said, my name is Erica Smith and I have worked inside Philadelphia's Juvenile Justice Services Center, used to be called the Youth Study Center, um, since 2002. And I'm with a program out of the Children's Hospital Philadelphia. We are in there to um, reduce unwanted sexual health outcomes, including HIV, in the lives of youth that we deem highest risk. So um, just a little bit about the program. We provide intensive sexuality education from a trauma-informed perspective. We um, do intensive risk reduction, case management, and advocacy in the system in general. So there's a lot of collaboration with POs, PDs, judges, et cetera, to ensure the best health outcomes for youth. And we do follow youth long-term inside and outside of detention and keep in touch with young people by mail when they are at other facilities. Many of the clients we serve are LGBTQ youth, especially transgender youth assigned male at birth and now presenting as feminine. So I wanted to give everyone a content warning because I'm speaking about the experiences of this population inside juvenile justice facilities and we have to talk about some pretty difficult subjects including rape and violence. So just a fair warning. Um, I have had a front seat to the treatment of this population for almost 16 years, and while I've only worked inside of one facility, so many of the young people I work with are sent out to other facilities, and so I hear about their experiences in those other facilities, and that would include state placements, residential treatment facilities, et cetera. Um, so first of all, everything in juvenile justice is very binary, according to gender. So there are male housing units and female housing units, but not all uh, gender nonconforming youth are treated the same. Basically, if it is much more permissible for young women or people assigned female to have romantic relationships with one another and to display gender variance. 
they can still be subject to homophobia and transphobia of staff, but just not nearly as much as if they were assigned male young people who now present as trans feminine or if they were gender nonconforming gay and bisexual boys. So um, I just want to talk about what is the worst case scenario for young LGBTQ people in detention. And these are some of the things that um, were in place when I started this work. So it was very common for young people to experience harassment and intimidation by residents and staff, um, including homophobic and transphobic slurs, sexual violence and physical violence, including rape, isolation from other youth and ostracization, um, intentional sabotage in court reports, um, targeted humiliation, when young people were involved in conflict, it was always made their fault. A lot of staff would refuse to use correct names and pronouns. And a lot of times you go by your last name in detention, but they would um, make a point to use the incorrect first name for young people as a way to humil humiliate them. Um, targeted humiliation, refusal to cooperate with LGBTQ supportive services, such as our program. And there were anti-LGBTQ attitudes pervasive from the top down and in the courts. So if you did have an issue, there was nobody to address it because nobody really had the competency, but also just didn't necessarily care and often held the same attitudes as, as the on the ground staff. Um, here's a couple examples. I remember a young person went to court and a court psychologist wrote in their report, we have to figure out what it is. And there was a young transgender youth who came into the center wearing a weave and she was awakened in the middle of the night and made to take it out in front of a whole bunch of staff. That's just an example. So I'm gonna talk about some uh, specific cases. The first person I'm gonna talk about is a young transgender girl named Aaliyah. Aaliyah went to a state placement in Pennsylvania in the mid 2000s. And she kept a journal of her treatment every single day and mailed it to us here at CHOP. We took it directly to her judge and she got pulled out of the placement. And her story is one of repeated and pervasive violence, harassment and rape. Uh, while Aaliyah was in this placement, her sister died. And some of the quotes that I have on this slide are things that were said to her when her sister died. Um, she was told to take you know, her grief somewhere else and she wasn't allowed to speak to anybody about it. She was constantly being called slurs. Other youth sexually harassed her or constantly threatened to rape her. Um, they attempted to rape her in the shower and actually did rape her in her room. She was slapped in the face by staff who said things like, I'm gonna bring the man out of you. At one point, she wrote in her journal, the reason I haven't written lately is because the same stuff has been going on every day and I'm constantly being terrorized. The experience of Kira is not much different. Kira is a transgender female who went to another Pennsylvania state placement for boys in the mid 2000s, a different one. She was singled out by staff. They made fun of how she talked and walked. They humiliated her in front of other residents. In the middle of winter, they would put her in a single room and open the window in the freezing cold and not give her a blanket. They would throw buckets of cold water on her feet and not let her change her socks. She was blamed for all of the conflict on the unit as the common denominator. And some of the things that they said to her are on this slide. Um, she was made to stand in front of the mirror and say that she was a man who needed to face the man in the mirror. She was also sexually assaulted and raped multiple times by other youth who would orchestrate that they could do it while the staff had their backs turned. Um, staff were extremely homophobic and so they would encourage the other youth to harass her. At one point, she was orally raped by one of the other people in the placement and blamed for it. And what I'm putting up on the next slide is the quote that was said to Kira and her abuser after her abuser raped her. Um, so basically they understood why he did what he did, but they told her that she was not a person. She was also uh, spoken to the slide you see here, the director of the facility told her, you would go to great lengths to have sex because you're out of control. Keep in mind she was sexually assaulted. 
I wouldn't want a person like you living anywhere near me. Your behaviors are of a perverted person who would molest a child. And this is the director speaking to her. Another example was a, a young black gay man named Byron. He was living with HIV and he went to a placement also somewhere in upstate Pennsylvania. And before he got there, the staff sat all the other boys down and said the following to him. Um, they told all the boys this quote you see on the slide. And the reason that we know that is because his cousin was there and heard this. Um, he ended up getting FTA'd from this placement because they accused him of trying to transmit HIV to everybody else. Um, another issue that we have dealt with over the years are placements claiming to be LGBTQ competent or trans competent who are not. Um, they may put it in pamphlets, but we don't you know, have any way to validate their claims and judges are not required to verify these claims before they send youth out. So often this just means one time we had a trans kid at our placement. Um, there was a place in Virginia that they were sending young people to about eight years ago, claiming they had a special unit for trans youth. Uh, my colleague and I visited, and what we discovered is that the trans youth were all in one unit by themselves. They were not integrated into the day-to-day -day activities with other residents, and they were being treated by a team that was very, very incompetent um, surrounding trans youth issues. So. Um, that Philadelphia does not send young people to this place anymore. Um, it can also be more difficult for young people of color when they go to rural placements where um, if the placement doesn't know what to do with an LGBTQ kid, they certainly don't know what to do with a black LGBTQ kid. So things can be even worse for them. Trying to speed it up a little. Um, there is there is some good news though. Um, things really turned around in Philadelphia and I work on the ground in this center all the time. So I'm not talking it up because I've been told to. I truly have seen um, pretty incredible change. There was a lawsuit um, of a young transgender woman who sued the center for discrimination. A policy change happened. And right now we have some pretty incredible leadership who really follows through with that. And I believe that Philadelphia is an example of how it can get better. Um, when there are problems, they are not on a widespread level. They tend to be from individual staff and their personal opinions. And this often happens in the form of other residents harassing the LGBTQ youth and staff not necessarily intervening as quickly as they should. Um, when the right people are notified, the issue is resolved quickly. And I say that as someone who's on the ground in there. Um, right now we have a trans girl in there and she she did express frustration that she feels like she can't um, act up in the way that cisgender girls do. So I have heard kids say that they feel the scrutiny is on them extra to be like more exemplary young people. And if they do misbehave, they fear that it's um, made up, it gets made about their gender. So what I have to say here about a best case scenario for LGBTQ kids in detention is a comprehensive policy, training, correct usage of names and pronouns, correct undergarments, um, giving young people the underwear and bras that correspond with their gender identity is huge. That youth are housed according to their gender identity when it's safe. And this is in accordance with the Prison Rape Elimination Act or PREA. Um, that youth are not isolated, that there's zero tolerance for verbal and physical abuse, that they are transported safely during court transport and housed safely at the courthouse. Sometimes they leave the JJSC and then the folks that run that center don't have control over what happens to them at court. And trans youth and LGBTQ youth have experienced um, harassment there. Uh, it's important that they do have access to trans affirming medical care, that there is zero tolerance for staff infractions and that leadership sets the example. So um, just to end, there is still a lot of work to be done because while things have greatly improved in Philadelphia, we don't know what happens in other facilities. We don't control that. We don't know what happens to youth in other states or in rural areas. Um, we have to think about, are there policies in place? Are they comprehensive and updated? And who is watching, who is holding these other facilities accountable? Thank you. Great, thanks so much for that, Erica. Um, next, we're gonna move on to Christina Moon, who is a staff attorney at Education Law Center and is going to explain some of the experiences, how some of the experiences Erica described affect the education of LGBTQ youth while they're incarcerated. And she's also gonna give us some context 
for the educational resources generally available to these youth in juvenile justice facilities. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, so as, um, as was described, I am with Education Law Center. Um, our mission is to ensure access to a quality public education for all children in Pennsylvania. We do that um, through a variety of impact litigation, policy advocacy, and things like um, being a member of the Legal Center for Youth Justice and Education so that we can bring more information um, like this to a wide audience uh, uh, serving particularly vulnerable groups of students. So the front end barriers, um, Asaf kind of already mentioned, um, but I just wanted to share this great graphic from the Center for American Progress. Um, disproportionate push out in school to prison pipeline. Um, LGBT youth make up between five and 7% of the overall youth population, but represent 15% of those in the JJ system. Um, and this matters because while they may not be receiving a unique education in the JJ system, if they are overrepresented in the JJ system and we have concerns about the education everybody in the JJ system is receiving, as we do, um, then they're feeling this um, lack of quality education more. Um, and also, as Asaf mentioned, um, the disengagement from school at the front end um, is really relevant because if you are, um, if your experience in a neighborhood school um, is that of disengagement um, and lack of quality um, focus, uh, ability to focus rather on education, then once you are in a JJ system where the services are much less rigorous, then um, you're absolutely not gonna be able to um, have those supports to succeed. Um, just sharing another great graphic from our friends at um, Movement Advancement Project about the overrepresentation of youth of LGBT youth in the JJ system and pointing out also the intersecting identities. Obviously our kids don't have any one um, identity often, um, for example, LGBT and GNC gender nonconforming youth in JJ facilities are also youth of color, 85% so. Um, and likewise, um, kids with disabilities are entering the JJ system at a rate five times higher than youth in the general population. So what's at stake um, beyond the fact that we care about the education of every student? Um, these students will most return to the community often within one year after uh, placement in the juvenile justice system. And uh, the outcomes are not good for the, any youth in the JJ system. Nationally, as many as two thirds of youth have dropped out of school after release from the system. Um, and only 27% of Pennsylvania youth, for example, where we work, um, get a high school diploma. And um, nationally, behind in math and reading um, and more likely to reoffend the correlation there. Um, so the rights of students in uh, JJ, um, I share this um, with the acknowledgement that some of this is gonna be state specific. Um, so check your local school codes, um, but generally you don't lose your education rights because you're adjudicated delinquent. Um, so look to the local compulsory school age and right to attend. Um, in Pennsylvania, that's you have to be in school between eight and 17 and you have the right to attend until 21 or you meet graduation requirements. We also suggest looking to um, whether there is support for students to attend the local public school district where the delinquency facility is located. We have a good um, local law on that. So we um, actually, um, our problem is a step further, which is that, you know, sometimes our courts misunderstand um, and think that, for example, if a student is um, not attending school or not doing well in school and is presented in their courtroom adjudicated delinquent, um, they, the, the judges we're told, think that, well, we'll send them to this placement that has an on-ground school and they'll have to be attending school and that will be better for their education without um, the understanding that the education services available in these placements are not good, not good. and they would be better served uh, able to attend the local off-ground school. Um, there's variations in how schools are licensed, so look to that in your jurisdiction. Um, and also just flagging, um, there may be differences in um, when youth are charged 
or convicted as adults. And in Pennsylvania, for example, that comes up with a different minimum requirement of hours per week. Um, advancing here. So federal education civil rights, um, and Asaf already mentioned some of this as well, so I'll try to um, move quickly through. But um, we look to Title IX for um, equal access to um, academic coursework and career and technical education without regard to sex or gender. So for example, um, boys should not be um, funneled into auto repair and girls provided only cosmetology, CTE education. English language learners retain their rights to overcome language barriers. Um, harassment and violence on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, disability under all of the Title VI um, rights are retained as well. I'm uh, gonna speed through to hit quickly on special education rights. Um, the IDEA obviously provides students with special education needs a free and appropriate public education entitlement. Um, you don't lose that right to uh, FAPE when you're adjudicated uh, and entered into a JJ placement. Um, so IDEA protections here um, are still maintained by the youth and the parent. Um, so this is a really big um, advocacy point. Um, and I'm gonna fly through, unfortunately, given time, but these slides will be available afterward. Now, talking specifically about education services in the facilities, um, it's not good um, in most of the places that we're familiar with. Um, there are, at the entrance point, delayed record transfers from the school, so the, so the facilities claim they don't know where to start the students, um, on what level of work, um, and so students are often working below their level. Um, they get less instruction time often each day, um, and there's less academic rigor. The teachers are often not certified. There is no live instruction or less live instruction. We hear too often about kids being given worksheets um, that are below their grade level or um, sat in front of a computer and told to click through until you get it right um, on a cyber on a program, program or, um, or at uh, worst given access to some YouTube videos and claim that that's instruction. Um, there are credit transfer issues. Um, you can imagine the frustration from students um, who think they're earning credits that'll go to their graduation at their school, um, only to realize when they are back at their school that they, um, they um, are behind track and are not gonna graduate on time. And the lack of oversight and accountability um, to that school district that that's, um, has responsibility and uh, the State Department of Education uh, is a big problem because these schools are operating in, uh, in silos and um, without enough transparency. Uh, also, the conditions of confinement obviously can interfere with their education. Um, those who have the uh, special education needs, um, often the facilities don't have the continuum of services that are necessary to serve these kids. Segregated living units um, mean that kids are not actually um, given the same access to school. Um, and obviously punitive sanctions like segregation or solitary confinement means that kids are, that their school is interrupted or they're prevented from attending whatever school is actually available in the facility. Um, I've uh, mentioned reentry and I know Kara is gonna um, do so as well, but we have concerns about any students that are automatically diverted to an alternative or disciplinary school and credit transfers I mentioned. Tune in to another webinar in April um, that will talk about some ESSA protections that um, should make this better, that requires increased coordination between facilities and school districts um, through all of these issues that are bulleted here. And I don't unfortunately have time to go into, um, but look out for a webinar from us at Eagle Center for Youth Justice Education and the American Youth Policy Forum. Um, some more examples about what reforms are available. Um, are really, um, I'm gonna pause my screen hopefully in time to show you um, uh, this website, Blueprint for Change, um, is jjeducationblueprint.org. Uh, and this is a pol um, resource from the Legal Center for Youth Justice and Education that has identified 10 goals um, that if, um, for quality education in facilities, for example, um, and benchmarks that if achieved um, would provide that student with a greater access to services. And what's great about each of these goals 
um, and benchmarks is that there are also resources, policies, and practices um, in different states and nationally that you can um, look for. You can search by state, you can search by goal, and um, we hope that this is a good resource for everybody. So please do look to this um, if it can be helpful to you. And I apologize. Go ahead, Liz, let's hand it over. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, so our last presenter is Kara Engelhart, who is a law fellow at Lambda Legal. And she's gonna be discussing what LGBTQ youth face when they exit juvenile justice facilities and try to reintegrate back into the school environment. Take it away, Kara. Great, thank you. Can you all see my slides okay? I, I, did a, I have a dual monitor system and I just wanna make sure it's visible. Switch to other screen, I'm told. I don't know how to do that. Okay, so I'll, I'll end this and we'll just do this from my PowerPoint. Okay, great. So um, I'm talking about reentry and reintegrations in school and society. And I just want to start off at the very outset and say that when I do these panels, often reentry ends up being placed at the um, end of a panel, which is totally fine. I, I don't mind when I talk, but it, it sort of implies that involvement in the juvenile justice system is linear and has a finite conclusion and that reentry is the end of your involvement. Um, what I'll talk about and highlight and explain is that that's not necessarily the case, that involvement in the juvenile justice system is often cyclical, um, in large part because reentry services are very insufficient and push people back towards being criminalized. So first, I want to tell you about Lambda Legal. Um, we are the nation's oldest and largest legal organization that advocates on behalf of LGBT people and people living with HIV, primarily through impact litigation, public education, and public policy work. We have a, uh, a number of different core projects within our mandate and mission. Um, one that I wanted to highlight because it's specifically relevant here is Lambda Legal's Youth and Out-of-Home Care Project, and I, this is our mission um, posted here. You'll get this slide. I don't, don't need to read it. Um, and I want to talk about, just at a high level, the definition of reentry. Um, young people leaving juvenile justice residential placement face many concerns as they reenter the community, home, uh, school, workforce. And reentry refers to those activities and tasks that prepare youth placed out of home for reentry into their families and communities. Unfortunately, many youth return to unstable home settings or struggle to remain in school, like we've heard, and may lack skills needed for employment upon leaving secure placements. Further, the majority of youth involved in the juvenile justice system have a mental health disorder, and support services in their home communities are hard to arrange until they are formally released which can cause a gap in services that negatively impacts the reentry process. And additionally, as we've discussed, LGBTQ young people are overrepresented in the JJ system, which compounds difficulties at the point of reentry. So here's like a high level roadmap of what I'm gonna talk about here today. Um, first, I will give you a general context of the state of reentry. Um, but there are really three key roadblocks that increase the likelihood of recidivism and create challenges for rebuilding lives for LGBT young people in particular. Even before they have a criminal record, many LGBTQ people are isolated from their families, face bullying, harassment, unfair treatment at school, lack employment opportunities because of discrimination, have their lives criminalized, and are targeted by the police. And these challenges don't go away while someone is in prison or jail. In fact, they can become even more pronounced once someone gets out. Like other formerly incarcerated people, many released LGBTQ people also may have a history of substance abuse and physical and mental health issues, few have completed school. Together, all of these factors can be linked to high rates of insecurity and instability. All of them add up to huge challenges for LGBTQ people who have criminal records and have spent time in juvenile justice facilities. So before I dive into why reentry is particularly challenging for LGBTQ young people, 
I want to provide some context for the state of reentry. And because I'm in Chicago, um, and there's great juvenile justice reform efforts here in the state of Illinois, I'm going to use Illinois as a case study example. The Illinois Youth Reentry and Improvement Law of 2009 directed the Illinois Juvenile Justice Commission to make recommendations for increasing the likelihood that young offenders will succeed after they're released from state youth prisons. But before making these recommendations, the commission conducted a study of how decisions are made in the state's reentry system, which includes the Department of Juvenile Justice, the Prison Review Board, and parole officers with the Department of Corrections. The commission is federally mandated, um, and it's a state advisory group to the governor, the General Assembly, which is our legislature, and the Illinois Department of Human Services. Um, there are 25 commission members who are made up of experts from a cross-section of stakeholders, from people in the juvenile justice field to law enforcement, to nonprofits, mental health experts, et cetera. And the study concluded both a positive and a negative, I guess, that the system's not broken, or is broken, but it's not beyond repair. Um, it's really intended to help juveniles to move from prison cells back to their home communities where they can continue rehabilitation because the purpose of juvenile justice is different from adult criminal systems because the purpose is rehabilitation. Um, so in reality though, the system here in Illinois does little to prepare young people for life outside prison walls. They also concluded that youth on parole rarely receive the needed services or school linkages and too often return to expensive youth prisons due to technical parole box violations. And what a technical parole violation is, is something that's su often surprising to people who aren't um, deeply enmeshed in criminal and juvenile justice reform. It's when someone violates terms of their parole that it takes an action that's not necessarily criminal under the criminal legal code, but is prohibited by their probation or parole standards. And therefore, because they broke those rules, it's as if they violated criminal law and can be replaced in out-of-home care or detention. And finally, um, the Prisoner Review Board, or the PRB here, here in Illinois, um, has parole revocation proceedings. And they have been found to be largely perfunctory, where the youth's right to a lawyer and due process aren't protected. So like I said before, reentry is often seen as the end of a linear system, like a final step, but it's circular. If the PRB can revoke your parole, if you can, you know, if minute things can lead to technical parole violations, you can end up right back in the system. Um, so I know I just pointed out a really bleak picture, but like I said, there are reform efforts underway. And the Illinois Juvenile Justice Commission provided improvement suggestions back to the governor, our legislature, and um, the Illinois Department of Human Services. Um, for instance, the state statutes that mandate a rehabilitative juvenile justice system for juvenile offenders, but parole officers rarely help juveniles obtain schooling, mental health counseling, addiction treatment, and employment that they need for successful community reentry. And these agents that supervise mixed adult and juvenile caseloads don't effectively link young people to needed and often PRB mandated services. So they suggest that aftercare specialists be, they suggest a program of aftercare specialists that be specifically focused on juveniles. They also think that the Department of Juvenile Justice here should develop young people or youth appropriate graduated sanctions for violations of parole conditions so that aftercare specialists shouldn't just rely on returning youth to prison for technical violations like truancy or curfew violations and that the expectations for behavior and punishment for violations should be explained really clearly to young people and their families because often people violate have have these um technical violations because they didn't even know that their behavior would technically violate their parole. And finally, um, a judge, not rather than a, the prisoner review board, 
should preside over parole revocation hearings, because um, that's not the case now, and there is a right to counsel in those hearings that's not really being respected. Also, youth routinely remain on parole in Illinois until their 21st birthday, and excessive time on parole increases the likelihood of reincarceration re for the, the reasons we just stated, the revocation of your parole or technical violation. And so they say that the length of parole should be limited by law. And altogether, it's just sensible to make these kinds of reforms. And, and as I'll talk later, to, to properly care for LGBTQ young people, it, it, it's a cost-saving measure. It costs much more to incarcerate a young person than to properly rehabilitate them and reintegrate them into their community. Now on to the LGBT specific issues. There is um, an overall lack, in, in general, not everywhere, but lack of competency in reentry programs. Um, looking specifically at prison reentry programs, we can ask the question why is sex education and HIV prevention important in the reentry curriculum? But reentry programs are designed to ease the process of an individual's return to their home. Or community, and education is a big part of successful reentry and ranges from literacy classes to interpersonal communication skills um, to comprehensive sex education and HIV and STI prevention. And those, those kinds of trainings are currently missing for most reentry programs on both the state and the federal level. Um, men who have sex with men or MSM have the highest risk of contracting STIs. HIV specifically greatly affects MSM, with 57% of people living with HIV in the U.S. are reported to be gay and bisexual men. Young MSM in the U.S., especially young Black and Latino men, are affected disproportionately. And transgender people and LGBTQ people in the U.S. also have a heightened risk of exposure, especially when sharing and reusing needles for hormone injection or drug use. So the prevention of HIV and other STIs for those re-entering their communities is challenged by the lack of education, especially among LGBTQ youth. And adding sex education to re-entry curriculum will increase knowledge about overall STI prevention, testing, and access to healthcare in the larger LGBTQ community. Additionally, prior to release from incarceration, many facilities assist people in obtaining the kind of identity documents you need to transition to get housing and education and other social programs. But staff are often unaware of the necessary paperwork for obtaining accurate identity documents for transgender people. And so we need to have better programs that make those services available because without a proper identity document, you can run into all kinds of barriers. Um, Additionally, regarding probation and parole, and I'm just trying to hurry through here to get you all out on, at a reasonable time. Um, once someone's released from incarceration, if someone's placed on parole or probation, they're, like I said, required to adhere to strict and burdensome requirements and regularly re meet with parole or probation officers. And even, and another example of requirements for parole is that there have been cases in which a transgender person's dressing in accordance with their gender has resulted in a violation of parole terms. Further, um, there can often be travel limitations on your probation or parole. And for trans folks or people living with HIV in more rural areas, or even LGB members of the community who want competent access or access to competent healthcare may have to travel outside of the perimeter where they're permitted to, to gain good, competent health care. And an officer might not approve that kind of request to travel or might consider someone in violation of their parole if they do that. Pervasive discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Oh, OK, I've been told time is up. So these slides will be provided. Um, but I'll just really quickly highlight that discrimination against LGBT people is um, compounded when they have a criminal record because of barriers already to people with criminal records and pervasive discrimination um, against LGBT people. And so here are some collateral consequences. And finally, um, 
if you or your clients ever face legal issues relating to their LGBT status or their HIV status, please reach out to our help desk. We respond to every single call or email submission or letter from someone who's incarcerated. Every single call is reviewed by our help desk attorney, and we try to get back to people with um, references to local attorneys that can work with them, or potentially we get some of our cases from there. And you can follow us on social media. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much to Kara and the rest of the presenters. Um, we got a bit of a later start, so thank you for all bearing with us and hanging on to the end of the um, webinar. So this is just the start of a conversation. This is a particularly vulnerable population, and it's going to take a lot more conversations to figure out how to ameliorate some of these injustices they face. So for next steps, I hope that you all participate in our Twitter storm, or more accurately, Twitter chat, still getting the Twitter lingo down. Um, we're going to email out the date for that, but we're hoping it will be sometime this week. That will help us raise awareness about these issues. I hope you'll also become part of the ongoing conversations happening through the Legal Center for Youth Justice and Education, and the link to join that listserv is on your screen. Um, lastly, like Christina mentioned in her presentation, if you are advocating for youth in this position, I hope that you will go to the Blueprint for Change um, to get some advocacy tips. And lastly, um, on, unfortunately, we were very short on time today, um, so um, we didn't have time to answer questions. Yeah. So I hope that you will uh, type any questions you have in the question box on your screen, and we will answer them in a follow-up email uh, later this week. And if you have a question for specific panelists, um, we are all willing to answer questions later. So our contact information is on your screen. Thank you again.